welcome all to the next installment of Culinary Luminaries. This is uh, for Madeline uh, Kamen. I must say, anyone who um, has the guts to say to Julia Childs that she was neither uh, a chef nor French um, has my vote. But I'm Bee Banyu, and I am chair of the New School's Food Studies Program. So I get to tell you a little bit about the Food Studies Program. Um, uh, we offer classes um, in uh, food studies in three concentrations, um, culture, medium, uh, media, and communication, uh, politics and policy, and health and the environment. We offer a BA and an AAS degree in both, as well as minors for students from other colleges here at the New School. Um, we even have some classes that we offer in Open Campus, which is the um, continuing education uh, center for the school. Um, and we welcome you to take a look at Open Campus for any of the classes that we have available. One of the things that we're doing actually um, uh, tomorrow and Saturday uh, is we're hosting a very big conference. It's the Food Writing Forum. Uh, and we have an incredible array of people coming over the next two days, some of whom are actually in the room. Um, let me give you a little preview. Um, uh, for the plenary session, Diane Jacob and Andy uh, Smith, um, right over here, um, are going to have a nice conversation about digital media and blogging and how they re, uh, relate to the food world right now. Then we'll break into a, a panel of social media and online media hosted by um, or moderated by Fabio Parasecoli. Um, and uh, in the afternoon, there will be how to write a cookbook, blogs and websites framing and maintaining purpose. And the people on these panels are unbelievable. I mean. Florence Fabricant, Roseanne Gold, Roseanne Gold, who's here? She smiled, Roseanne Gold. Um, uh, uh, then there's um, uh, David Cook and uh, Deb Perlman in the blogs and website one. And it goes on and on and on. It's just day after day, which the first day culminates in a reception um, uh, where we hope people will be networking with each other because this is all about the new world of food and social media, uh, digital uh, media, all the sorts of things that the world is turning into um, as we speak. So um, if you're interested at all, we have posters over there um, on the table, the registration table, but you can go to Eventbrite and check out Food Writing Forum. And we hope to see some of you there um, as well. Right now, I think we'll just hand this mic over to Andy Smith, who is moderating this panel. Thank you, B. Um, I'm delighted to report this is the 13th culinary luminary program we have had since 2008. Uh, and uh, it is uh, somewhat ironic that the uh, first uh, culinary luminary panel that we had was on Julia Child. Does anybody remember Julia Child around here? Uh, she, who was one of my heroes, and even though I accept the criticism of Madeline Kamen, continues to be one of my heroes in life. So. Um, I'm, I'm delighted. I have on this panel, I'm the one person who only met Madeline once, and I'm sorry to report, I received a letter in the mail when I first started teaching at the New School. Does anybody remember letters in, in the mail? Is it, this is something uh, many of my students do not understand. Um, and in this, it was Madeline Cameron asking to come and sit in my culinary history class. And uh, I didn't quite know who she was. I was aware that she'd published cookbooks, and I was aware that she did the PBS uh, program, uh, Madeline Cooks, uh, but I was not familiar with her beyond that. Uh, she came into my class, um, and uh, she came in a couple minutes late, and I started the class. Uh, I, when I finished the class, uh, she walked out, <laughs> and I never had a conversation with her. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this panel to find out all the things that I missed. Uh, and thankfully, uh, all of our panelists, except one, did have good and close contact with her, and I'm delighted. Now, I want you to know that uh, I have no need to introduce any of the panelists, and the reason is very simple, because everybody knows who they are, and because we've just handed out their biographies. So um, all I can do is say, uh, please do look at that. If I started doing their full biography, I'm sorry to report, uh, I, we would be here for the next two hours on their um, things that they have done in, in the culinary field. 
I would like to introduce uh, Kathy Kaufman from um, faculty for the new food studies program of the New School, who will introduce Madeline. Thank you, Andy. Um, it is a pleasure to be here to talk about Madeline, and I think it is interesting that this is kind of bookending the Julia Madeline, um, what shall we call it, controversy? Maybe that's kind of a value neutral word. Um, everyone here knows about Julia's life story, right? You've seen the movie, you've seen all of the blogs, all of the publicity. How many people actually know much about Madeline's life story? Okay, yeah, and you would, yeah, there, there are a few, but not so many. So my job to start is to tell you a little bit about Madeline's life because I think in many ways her background informs some of the challenges and joys that she had uh, in her cooking profession. Uh, she was born in Corbevoie, which is a suburb of Paris, in 1931 and spent childhood summers uh, and in her teenage years at her aunt's or great aunt's one-star restaurant in Touraine, France, doing everything from scullery work to cutting vegetables and eventually learning something about cooking. Uh, when World War II came about, uh, she, like so many French people, suffered tremendously. Uh, her, she talks about the great hunger that she experienced. Uh, after World War II uh, concluded, she came back to Paris. There was little money in the family for education, so although she had one year at the Sorbonne and had wanted to continue, she was unable to do so, but instead went to Le Cordon Bleu cooking school and finished her culinary education. Uh, at that point, uh, she gets a job with Swiss Air, acting in their, as their reservations manager. She was trilingual, and that was very, very useful. Uh, she meets um, uh, Alan uh, Kamen. They get married. She moves to the States around 1960. They land in Philadelphia. And she actually goes into a bit of a depression because she is not able to speak her native tongue or have her native foods or any of those things what gets her out of the depression, according to various interviews she's, she gave while she was around, was teaching adult ed cooking. Then, of course, because Madeline was opinionated and demanding, and that was one of her great strengths, as well as one of the things that did tend to trip her up a bit in life, uh, she writes to Craig Claiborne in the uh, late 60s because he's published a recipe for escargot, which she's horrified by, I think is probably a fair way of phrasing it. Craig is so impressed with the letter that he travels to Philadelphia. They have lunch and she prepares escargot the way she believes they should be prepared and he is impressed and starts talking about her. It leads ultimately to her first book contract, The Making of a Cook. And one thing I just want to emphasize, it's very important that that was the making of a cook, not a chef, and she was very prickly, and I think rightfully so, about the differences between cooks and chefs. And while she, I think, eventually thought of herself as a chef, she really had a tremendous value and respect for the cook. Anyway, things happen. She moves to Boston around 1970-71. She opens the Modern Gourmet Cooking School and has a restaurant that is open, I think it's three nights a week, that is staffed by her students, uh, Chez La Mère Madeleine. It is considered by many, including Paul Bocuse, keep that name in mind, there is a little bit of a debate go or controversy there, uh, to be one of the finest restaurants in the country. It received four stars from the Mobile Guide and five stars from Anthony Spinazzolo, who was the restaurant reviewer for the Boston Globe. Of course, we know that there is a debate with Paul Bocuse, who at that time said women belonged in the bedroom, not in the kitchen, and Madeleine was infuriated by that. So there was a photograph of Paul Bocuse in the kitchen of Chez La Mère Madeleine that was upside down to let everyone know what she thought of Bocuse. Also, there is a notorious feud between Madeleine and Julia, and Madeleine once told me part of the reason she was so upset was Ju with Julia was that Julia never came to Chez La Mère Madeleine, and she took that as a personal affront and personal insult. So just 
put that in the back of your minds. Anyway, she goes back to France for a couple of years to open a cooking school, but getting disgusted by the sexism in France and the tax man in France comes back to the US. Uh, she shortly thereafter discovers that she has a very serious heart condition and has to lighten up some of her cooking. Uh, she eventually relocates to the Napa Valley, founds the School for American Chefs at Behringer Vineyards, and said that Napa felt like home to her because people there took food seriously. She finally found a place in the United States that I like. So I think there's this underlying theme through much of her life of some depression, some feeling out of place that perhaps is reflected in the way she was also viewed popularly as not, not the warm and fuzzy Julia Child, but this kind of unhappy uh, person. Uh, she also embraced Buddhism. She was a, Buddhism, a Buddhist at that point. Anyway, to tell you a little bit about the School for American Chefs, it took eight students a year. She called it Graduate School for Working Chefs. Uh, it was a very short program. It was a two-week intensive program out at Behringer. Uh, I was privileged to be one of her students in the penultimate School for American Chefs. Uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of what that was like, you would think we would be in the kitchen cooking all day and working at her, her elbow. No. We sat around a conference table in this lovely dining area. There was someone cooking for us most of the time. And we were discussing things like the topography of the Napa Valley and how that was influencing the wines, taking field trips to go taste wine, um, doing things, discussing what we were reading. She recommended Plato that we should all be reading The Republic and things like that. None of this garbage stuff that you're all reading. You need to be improving your mind. I remember once um, I had a, a more fraught relationship with Madeline, perhaps, and some of the folks here are having both worked with her at Peter Kump's New York Cooking School uh, and out at Behringer asking, what was my cooking style? And at that point, I was uh, working as a private chef for a very wealthy, very fat man, and I had to cook. <laughs> Marion knows. Marion understands. Uh, and my style had to be very light. And I said, well, it's kind of Mediterranean. And I got a, there's no such thing as Mediterranean <clears throat> style. So, you know, she did not tolerate imprecision. And when you read her recipes, you realize they are fabulously precise and some of the most wonderful, wonderful recipes that you will ever encounter. So just a very quick, uh, quick bibliography. Her works, in addition to The Making of a Cook, Dinner Against the Clock, When French Women Cook, In Madeline's Kitchen, Madeline Cooks, which had the off-show PBS show that ran from 1984 to 1991. So again, you see a lot of parallelism with Julia Child, which is an issue for her. Uh, Madeleine Camden Savoie, The Land, People, and Food of the French Alps, which is a fascinating and wonderful book. Uh, and then her new Making of a Cook, which was the James Beard Cookbook of the Year. And uh, the same year, she also got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Beard Foundation. Uh, and other accolades include a knighthood in the French Ordre des Arts et des Lettres, given by the French Ministry of Culture. So with that, I think I will pass along to Bob. Our next uh, speaker is Bob Pritzker, who is a restaurateur and a close friend of Mamla. Bob. Thanks, Andy. Um, I brought, thinking it might be of interest to the folks, three of Madeline's cookbooks. It's the dirty ones with pages stuck together by creme anglaise. So if you want to pass them around, you should. I mean, they're, they're, they're a bit of history. And I, I don't know. My, my bag is there, and the books must be there. There are three, one paperback and two hardcovers. So Making of the Cook and... Uh, when French Women Cook, which is the one sandwiched in time between the, this and the last one I had, which was in Madeline's Kitchen, that gentleman has, in any event, <clears throat> enjoy them. Uh, I apologize for their condition. I had trouble finding them, and I had put them away. 
Not that I had put Madeline away. She put me away, so that's a good way to begin my story. Uh, I, and this is kind of the perfect uh, condition that is set up in America, when you want to cook, and you were at the age and at the time that I was wanting to cook, you celebrate the fact that Julia Child wrote a cookbook. And you teach yourself to cook by following the 12 pages of steps you do to make brioche, or God knows what else you find challenging. But they were all, of course, the Bible for me, who was self-taught. I wanted to cook. I should have probably made my mother happier and been more professional with my life, but I wanted to cook. And so there I was, this upstart who taught himself to cook uh, in Boston with ambitions to maybe make a career out of it, which I did, uh, first by being a caterer, and I'm not here to talk about me, but the point is this. I opened a restaurant. I don't think Anthony Spinozola gave me any stars ever. I'm not sure he came. But I had a restaurant in Back Bay uh, in a kind of nice location, if you will. And um, it was just a roll of the dice. I, I was married to a gal with, from whom I'm divorced. And we opened this restaurant together. And of course, it was a struggle because we were charging $7 prefix for dinner, you know, that kind of problem. And the Bostonians wouldn't spend money in Boston, they'd spend it in New York. But here's the point. I was able to piggyback my mediocre abilities on the backs of Madeline's students because she opened her modern gourmet cooking school and she'll tell you she saved my life financially and <laughs> culinarily. Why? Because I hired her students. She needed to put those kids out there in the field and she felt there was no one more desperate for <laughs> such help than I. <laughs> And so I hired some of the most wonderful kids. And in fact, when I looked at one of the books, which is, I think, Marion has it, When French Women Cook, it's, no, that's the, no, and then it doesn't matter. When French Women Cook, um, it's, there's a dedication in there to a list of folks. And one of those guys never came to me in Boston, but when I came and took my Dodin Buffon from Boston to New York, he came to me. He was the, his name is Richard Kazarian, three quarters of the way down the list. The most wonderful guy, caring deeply about food, wine. I think he finally left New York um, and went back to Cambridge to open a wine store. Not positive. But the fact that I didn't get him in Boston is heartbreaking because he was a joy. But I had two folks who gave me insight into what it was to be in Madeline's world because they worked, uh, cooked, and, and, and studied with Madeline by day and then came to me. One gal, short, Irish, wonderful gal, Caroline Lynch, um, was deciding that she would make the pot feuilleté and we didn't have to because she was good at it. <clears throat> so don't worry, Bobby, I'll do it. And I look over and She's got the pound of butter, and I see her squeezing it. I said, what the hell is, what's going on? Is this something, is this a perversion I need to know about? <laughs> and, and I just kind of went over there a little bit um, uneasy, because I didn't know quite what to say about this act of squeezing butter. But I noticed that the butter was being squeezed over a tub, a stainless steel bowl. Why? because Madeline was such a fanatic that she told the kids American butter, not unlike American Julia Child, was no darn good. Why was it no good? Because there was too much water in it. And if you got your fingers nice and cold before you touch the butter, because otherwise you might melt it, you could massage the butter and get all that water out. And I watched Caroline squeeze the butter, get the water out, and we ended up with all fat between the layers of uh, the pot and had the most remarkable pot feuilleté you could ever dream of. She, 
Madeline sent me all kinds of good kids. One gal whose name is Vivian. I can't think of her last name. I remember how she looked. I remember certain of her features. Um, she was dedicated. The third guy that spent a long time with us was a brown hockey player whose dad was a urologist. And he was great as well. Uh, why are you in this world, Peter? You're going to law school. Well, I love food. He's an Italian kid from Providence, Rhode Island. And Providence, Italian, food, it all works. I'm from Providence. So, <laughs> not Italian, I should have been. So, um, the point I'm making is, uh, Peter was great. Peter um, had tough Saturdays in the kitchen because Friday night was a big night for Peter and the boys. I don't have to explain. So anyway, I was saved by Madeline Kamen. Please make a note, write it down. Without Madeline, I was dead. Now, the other thing is, of course, I knew nothing because I learned to cook from Julia's books. And I'll leave it at that. I adored Madeline. I couldn't get close to her. I went to Mill Valley at some point after I sold my New York restaurant and went up to uh, Behringer to say hello. That wasn't fabulous. I mean, yeah, that was Madeline, but she's remarkable. And if you read some of the introductions to these chapters about the French women, everything is there in terms of her heart, her soul, her love for her country. And um, you, have to, you have to be thankful that she was there to get certain things straight in our lives because we don't have folks like that anymore. She was remarkable. Thank you. Can you give me that the big other mic? Yes, ma'am. Our next panelist is um, Chef uh, Scott Campbell, uh, butcher and baker steakhouse. Chef. Thank you for being here today. But um, I guess I was also very fortunate because I worked with Madeline probably, as I would say, probably during her most highly acclaimed and productive years. I worked with <clears throat> one of her protégés, which you probably know, Jimmy Schmidt, who went to Modern Gourmet. He was the chef at her school in Boston. And in the time that I got there, I was young to the, I guess you could say, restaurant industry, heard the praises of Madeline, if not once a day, probably a million times a day, to the point where if when she came into the restaurant to visit, it was like the second coming of Christ had just come in, that you know she could walk on water. In fact, <clears throat> with Jimmy Schmidt for a number of years, once a week we would hold classes, we would stop between lunch and dinner, pull out the making of a cook, sit down, test recipes, and according to Jimmy, and then later on with Madeline, you know, also have to get suggested academic reading, which you guys would like. Um, Waverly Roots, The Foods of France, The Foods of Italy, and Harold McGee on, uh, you know, on food and cooking. And after working there for about four years, moved to New York, and right when I came into New York, of course, knowing some of the names, picked up the Times one day, and there's Florence Fabricant with her Wednesday introductions to what was going on in the coming season. Tickets were going up for Madeline Kamen at, I guess, people that have been cooking for a while remember Time Life series. It was over by the Cary Kitchens, which is Starbucks holds the basement floor of it across from Equinox and Columbus Circle. And Madeline had a few days of doing classes there and met Peter Kump. And of course, Peter, being a very good talker, said, you know what? We teach the same thing she did. So I went to school there. And for probably the next oh, 15 years or so, every time Madeline was in town, I used to help her as well as other people, her, one of her books had just come out, I think it was in 84 or whatever, read her veal stock, which I knew intimately with working for Jimmy, so luckily I never got any shame, thank God. But um, it went well, but she was always very potent, as you said, on her lectures, very, I guess you could say, dense and granular in the sense that you really captured a lot of academia from anywhere from, well, you didn't get Plato, though. That was, more, <laughs> that was later on, but anyway. 
Um, it was always a pleasure. In fact, I had helped her at the Beard House, mostly every place. Never did the cooking show. But one time in the mid-'80s, um, my wife and I jumped in a plane, flew up to Glen, so we were probably got to see you. I think it was on a Sunday, flew in early, went to the restaurant, Madeline wasn't there, somebody called and said, one of your whatever, protégés, whatever, is here. She rushed over, we had lunch, said, you know what, you don't have enough time for dinner, so you might as well go back to Portland and fly back down again. So it was one of those times when spirit was very good. It probably cost $25 round trip and enjoyed every bite of it. Um, after that, um, I also went to um, Behringer's School for American Chefs. I believe I was in the second class that they had had there. So it was, you know, we covered so many different things. It was very intense. I think they were just starting to get their sea legs. In fact, one of the highlights for me for being a Michigander was one day Madeline said, you know what, we're gonna go over to Sonoma and I have a special guest that I would like you guys to meet. So it was MFK Fisher and we weren't gonna spend more than 10 to 15 minutes there and it was just under three hours and it was really cool because we're both Michiganders and I always thought she was kind of like the Georgia O'Keeffe of the food world, at least in appearance. So it was really very cool, but <clears throat> also talking. On one day, it was like one of those rough days. I guess she worked us like to the bone. She, we both shared uh, an equal musical uh, interest. So afterwards, she said, you know what? I'm gonna go chill out and listen to Mozart. And I was like, okay. <laughs> But uh, I guess on a funnier anecdote, I don't know if you guys got it, but we used to talk about garbage soup, which always, you got that one too, was she was the original, I guess, going with um, being economic in the kitchen, cradle to cradle, that you don't throw anything out, it goes into the soup, and you reboot it for another period, and then, um, also in the early 90s, we had gone back for another visitation at Behringer. It was one of Alan's birthdays and got to have East Coast lobster with all the people in Sonoma, which was like, for us, we're like, okay. I guess we were getting back to the good old Boston days, and she said, it's exotic out here. <laughs> <laughs> so later on with all the on sea and all that, one of my trips when I used to cook in uh, France all the time, I made the trek to uh, on sea to find out where this sacred ground was located and got to see the glacial, the glacial lake, even got lost downtown, couldn't find my car in Le Vieux Village, which was not the easiest thing, but I could kind of, I guess studying art, I kind of got her moxie from going back to Gustave Courbet, who was uh, an anarchist and a very famous painter back in the um, mid-1800s. Uh, and then I actually got to celebrate her famous hat trick, which I think was kind of the beginning of her retirement at the Beard Foundation, <clears throat> when she got her Lifetime Achievement Award. Also, she got uh, Cookbook uh, of the Year Award and also in best general category, and then slowly started to get these notes that Madeline was hanging up her apron, and then she cooked off into the sunset, and that was about it. Our next speaker is um, chef and restaurateur Ruth Gresser. I made a statement saying I wasn't going to give any new information about them, but I do have something in this case. Uh, Ruth has been uh, named a semifinalist in the James Beard Awards in the category of Outstanding Restaurateur for 1999, 2099. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was quite a shock. Um, but uh, it was a great shock. It was a great day and a great month. I didn't make it to the finalists, so we're, you know, but, but the, the moment of hearing that was, was really, really a special moment for me. Um, um, it, 
It's really wonderful to, for me to be here tonight to talk about Madeline. Um, uh, when I think about Madeline, um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is her signature phrase, uh, at least this is the Madeline I knew, her signature phrase was, don't let the turkeys get you down. Um, and I have no idea when I first heard it from her. I have no idea what she said it in response to, but that really wasn't the point because what the point was, was that whatever was distracting or depressing or upsetting you at the time, it was not important. And what was important was to stay focused. Um, and you should be focused on your food, focused on your goal, focused on the drops of oil as they're being emulsified into the egg yolks. Um, the other thing that was, that was important for her that she taught was to ignore negativity, um, overcome difficulty, suppress any self-doubt, and to keep moving forward on your own self-determined path. Um, I do remember that Madeline said it often. <laughs> It's actually inscribed in this book to me. Um, she said it to me, to others, and I think she said it to herself. Um, and of course, Madeline said it with a charming French accent, um, which made it all the more endearing and memorable. Um, I made what felt like a, a pilgrimage uh, to study with Madeline when she had her school in New Hampshire. Um, which came after NC and before she went out to California. Um, and and uh, I think she, it, she had it for a very short period of time because she had, uh, uh, she had been diagnosed with a heart ailment and running a restaurant and a school was, you know, a, a significant um, endeavor and when I realize it now, you know, I was in my late 20s, mid to late 20s. She was younger than I am, <laughs> am now <laughs> um, when I was studying with her. And uh, I can see, you know, <laughs> that it would, it would be something that you might want to step back from. Um, but I'm, I had made this pil pilgrimage and um, along with, with nine other students and we were gonna be um, in New Hampshire with Madeline for almost a year. Um, and on our first evening when we got to Glen, New Hampshire, um, Madeline took the class out to dinner and she told us we were going to the best restaurant in town. Um, so just remember, this is 1986, okay? Um, fresh was kind of a buzzword you know, but not so much outside of California. Um, and, you know, the words that we throw around now, like local and sustainable and heirloom and artisan and all of those other ones that we talk about, you know, weren't even in the vocabulary. Um, anyway, the group of us walked across the street um, and went to the best restaurant in town. And all I really remember about it, the restaurant itself, is that it was red. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if the walls were red or the carpet was red. I do remember that there, was, there were white tablecloths with red napkins, but red is the key thing about, about I don't know what the name was, I don't know. Um, the other thing that I remember is that um, they served us a main course of chicken breasts with a tomato sauce and a vegetable. And we all are eating. And Madeline stops us and takes advantage of this moment that she knew would come where she can teach. And she says, what do you taste? <laughs> um, and so there we are, 10 virtual strangers, right? Um, and that's the old definition of virtual. Um, <laughs> you know, embarking on this really scary and exciting adventure with this amazing teacher um, and this larger-than-life legend. Um, 
we knew, we all knew we'd be sharing really close quarters for almost a year. And at that night, you know, we'd hardly said hello to each other. We were kind of sniffing around to figure out where we were going to fall in this group of, that we now found ourselves in. And Madeline was just like, psh, putting us right on the spot. So we all froze, and nobody wanted to say the wrong thing. You know, because the way it, it had been set up, Madeline was taking us out, di out to dinner. She was treating us to a meal, right? <laughs> and I'm like, this meal is the, the best restaurant in town. And I'm thinking to myself, it kind of tastes like canned tomato soup. So finally, I very kind of shyly and quietly ask, is it Campbell's tomato soup? <laughs> and Madeline was elated. Oh. Exactly! <laughs> you know, she cries. <laughs> she was not only pleased that someone had figured it out, she was clearly, clearly just amused by the idea that the best restaurant any place in the world would be serving a, you know, a chicken breast with canned tomato soup as the sauce. That was the first, that was the first night. So we were off on this teaching, you know, journey. Um, the next day, the first day of class, you know, here we are, these 10 of us, just clamoring to start learning, to start getting in the kitchen and cooking. And what does Madeline do? She loads us in her van, and we go for a drive through the mountains. And she wants to show us the glaciers, the cuts through the mountains of the glaciers as the Ice Age thawed. Because what she wanted to do during that year was not only to teach us co cooking, um, but to teach us um, about culture and history and archeology, span anthropology, population movement, and science. So many of you probably know this book. You've, uh, uh, Robert has mentioned The Making of the Cook, and somebody else mentioned The New Making of a Cook. This is The New Making of the Cook. So this is her tome. This is kind of her life's work. Um, and um, for those of you who don't know it, I would strongly suggest you do. Um, but this is, the, this is the Madeline people know. This is the Madeline, if anybody knows Madeline, this is the Madeline that they know. Um, not many people know this, this Madeline. Um, uh, the Madeline who gave me this, which is a list of corrections for this book. Okay? Yeah, right, right? Um, so there are 18 corrections on this package of papers. Um, and to me, <laughs> this is where I differ from Madeline, 18, it's not so bad for, I mean, come on, right? <laughs> I, made, I, I, I wrote a tiny little cookbook, and I'm, there are probably that many. Anyway, um, but, but for Madeline, um, you know, this, this group of, of, of corrections, probably two or maybe three are significant enough that they would like alter the outcome when you cook one of the recipes. The rest really are typos. Um, and a lot of them are typos that probably people would figure out on their own. But, but Madeline was compelled, you know, to identify the errors and to at least attempt to notify her readers of the mistakes. And to me, that's Madeline kind of encapsulated. Intense, exacting, scholarly, and as a precise teacher, somebody else used the word precise, right? Um, you know, she wanted her readers to have the correct information. That was what was important to her. And I also think that she wanted her readers to know that she knew that there were some mistakes in case they came upon them. And she also wanted people to know, because it kind of says so right up here in the little paragraph at the beginning, that the mistakes happened 
during the publishing process. And they weren't at her mistakes. Um, she was one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. And she had an amazing ability to convey her passion and her knowledge to her students. Um, her palette was phenomenal, precise, you know, almost laser, and sauces. Their depth and complexity were her specialty. Um, Madeline's sauces were developed over days. You mentioned the veal stock. I know of yeah. like right? oysters and champagne sauce. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the sauces started with a robust, meaty veal stock, which she made from veal breast, not veal bones. So it, it, you know, it was flavored with fat and meat, um, as well as getting the collagen that you need to, to create a sauce. Um, and the, the veal breast was roasted deeply and caramelized, so it had a really good color. Um, and then you covered it with cold water and you cooked it slowly and simmered it for hours and hours and hours. Then that stock was then flavored and layered through reductions and additions over hours. So, and, and that was what, she, the, the result of that was that her, her essences. Um, and that's what we made for um, I brought, actually, um, I was going through my, my, uh, <laughs> my past, I guess, my past with Madeline, and I brought one of her menus, um, the restaurant that she, uh, that went along with the school was L'Auberge Madeleine. Um, and anyway, the sauces for all of the, of the, the dishes were made from these essences, um, and, uh, um, and so, th so you know, the, this complex process over days and then hours of intense reducing and adding more stock and reducing it down and adding more stock. And, and she was creating um, the, 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 the structure to then add fat. And the fat could be butter or, or it could be sour cream um, or it could be heavy cream or it could be egg yolks. Um, but the end product was a rich and complex. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I wrote these notes, and every time I get to this part, I just, I, I tear up. Um, they were gorgeous. They were absolutely, absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. Um, I, I can't help but smile when I remember the, 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 you know, the flavors that she created. Um, the, her sauces were her major contribution, in my opinion, to modern French cuisine. And I, for one, can't wait until they come back in favor. Um, I spent almost a year with Madeline, a year filled with passion and thought and history and food, a year that influenced me so deeply that it took Madeline's death for me to fully realize it. And I truly miss her. Thank you. Re Regina is the one person on the panel that never met Madeline. We put her at the end to help, hopefully give us some context. So, Regina? Okay, that's a hard act to follow, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, he said I knew uh, Madeline Cam in the right way only through her work, which is, I could judge her very mercilessly, I guess, because I didn't have anything, it was nothing personal. It was just, was she good or is she not? And I think she would appreciate that, that, um, my attitude in that way. I think she was like the original, I made this joke, she's like the original Dixie Chicks, like not ready to make nice. And, <laughs> and I don't think she went to her grave worrying that she really wasn't a household name like Julia Child. And I still get hate mail for writing that I didn't really like mastering the art of French cooking. But I always thought Madeleine Kamen's recipes were more, were just as rigorous, but more accessible to a lazy cook like me. She has a, um, in Madeleine's kitchen, has a great recipe for duck legs. It's kind of like a shake and bake for, for them with mustard on them, breadcrumbs, and butter. And then you bake them, and they're, they changed my life. But then 
reading her eight pages on how to do Kung Fu uh, was also life changing because I figured out how to do it without the gallon of fat, but still with the flavor. And she explains where the spices come from. They're basically Arabic in, in origin. And so she really was the antithesis of what uh, John and Karen Hess called a fake Laura. She really knew her shit. And, but it's, for all the scholarship, um, I think the taste was always what mattered in the end. And she would teach you how to put dishes together. So it wasn't just the duck legs. It was apricots and ginger to go with them or spinach with lemon to go with them. So you had a full plate so people could eat around the plate and really get an, an experience. And the other book that's great is Savoir because it insists that the recipes be so close to what they were at, their, at the source and really represented the region. So I, I think one of her rare concessions would be if you can't get nettles and strawberry leaves, you can replace them with chopped escarole, which you know, takes you there and you actually understand the flavors through that. And she did that at a time when too many Mexican cookbooks were still saying you could substitute parsley for cilantro. <laughs> and also telling you that fat would kill you. And she was doing recipes that would have a pound of cheese for, for potatoes. And I, I never imagined how she got that past the publishers and the sales forces. You know, it's, it's amazing. And of course, French, when she died, I really dragged out French, when French women cook because that book is extraordinary. And it's just so deep and rich and full of people. And I think it's interesting right now, I feel like young food writers are starting to understand that food stories need people. You need to wear, know where the food came from and who, the, who did it. And that's an extraordinary book. And the other thing that makes it ahead of its time when she tells you how long, the re how long the recipe takes, is it expensive, is it difficult, and when, which is pretty extraordinary for 1976, how, what season is best to make that dish? You're just not going to tell you to make zucchini in December or asparagus for Thanksgiving. Um, so I actually think, I'll make it really quick, that she's sort of, there's a big online debate right now among idiots that <laughs> do, you, do recipes need headnotes and backstories? Because people are just Googling for the recipe. They just give me the, the damn recipe. And her, her recipes really prove that you can, you can just take the recipe, but you need the context. You need where it came from, who did it, why does it matter? And so, she, you, I mean, you could do it, but you'd be poor without knowing the backstory. Um, I, I, I have a, a thousand questions I'd like to ask, but I do want to open this up to the audience. If you have questions, anybody have questions right now, or I'll just go on to my list that will, yes, go ahead. Michael, you, do you want to take a mic? Can we, uh, we don't, no, 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 we need a mic in order to get it on the film. You're being filmed. So I, ha I have one for Scott. Uh, can you tell us, since you worked with her on both coasts, uh, what changes, if any, occurred in her cooking when she went to California? Well, the one thing that I... Microphone. Do I got a mic? I didn't know that Madeline passed away, and unfortunately she passed away on my anniversary, so I was out of town, and I was like... You know those things, it's like your subconscious, and one day in December, I forget why I was looking it up, and I'm like, she's not with us anymore. I guess I get to throw a tearjerker in there too. But anyway, the one thing that got me, in fact, talking about Michael, um, one day I'm working at Windows on the World, and I'm making... Arnold Brion, uh, I need you to make a sauce. So I make a sauce, and I make the base for it. There was a restaurant called Cellar in the Sky, and it was an exclusive restaurant. So I give him the sauce. He's like, my god, that's very good for an American. <laughs> it was not a congenial place to, uh, to hang out, but I always thought that was funny. And now I get probably one instant messenger a day from Arno. He's very proactive. He learned how to do Facebook, so I guess we've bonded after all those years. But um, the one thing that really struck me, going back to Michael's question, and doing this look at it, and that's why I mentioned Corbet, because looking at it, she grew up in Paris. She was probably one of, the, grew up near one of the most famous areas for impressionistic paintings over by um, Bois de Bologna. Then she moves to Annecy. And looking back artistically, what that area was like. 
And where has she lived? She didn't like to live in cities, although one time I bumped into her on Fifth Avenue going to Tiffany's and she was drop dead, dressed well like a, you know, she could have lived on Fifth Avenue. But anyway, she always lived in the mountains. She was in Glen, as you said, going around on sea, that this was her breath. This is where she felt good. I think that's why she wrote the book on Savoir and women, because that's what spoke to her. It wasn't in her bain cooking, although she did get along with Andre Saltner, which his restaurant was named after Lutece, the first city in Paris, but that's what spoke to her. So I think there was definitely a sense of freedom in California. And I guess, because I was in the second class, luckily we got, we were like really hands-on. Of course, we picked her brain like, you know, we had four guys. One guy was from North Carolina, two were from Washington. I was from New York, of course I knew her, and we milked it. In fact, I even went back a couple of years later and took their wine course just to get kind of a second helping. And it was, you kind of really got to feel she was at ease or whatever. And of course, having your own business is not easy. So I think she was able to become more of herself or whatever. So getting back to it, I think the rural areas really spoke to her. And that was the reason why I mentioned the artist, because once I was looking at it, I was like going back in my mind, that's what jazzed her. And then the article that Michael suggested about um, when French women cook um, mentions how she was really, it made such a strong impact on her career and a person in general. Next question. Marianne. I'm just really curious about her food. Um, I met her a couple of times and we went to a, she took me to a extremely ordinary restaurant in Vermont that sounded just like the place that you described. But as this was being passed around, I just opened it at random to the French onion soup recipe. And at the end of it, it says, if you put in a couple of bouillon cubes, it'll taste a lot better. Can somebody explain that to me? Let, yes. I can explain yeah. that to you. No, I, I can explain that. Um, some of, uh, Madeline was not afraid of using enhancements. If you look through the new making of a cook, there are certain recipes that allow you to throw in a couple of bouillon cubes or use Beauvreel to bump up the flavor. And now here's a story, the first time I worked with Madeline, before I did uh, Behringer, she was teaching at Peter Kump's and I was going to be her stagiaire and I had the list of recipes. In fact, I have all of the recipes from that event here. You're welcome to look at them. They are not in any of her books, so they're very special. Anyway, she gives the recipe to make the veal stock and it's the breast of veal and you're browning it and she tells you how to cut the carrots and what size they need to be in all of this and then she finishes the recipe that she sends to me with add a bouillon cube at the end. And I'm like, what? I did not do it. She comes, she tastes the stock, and her palate is so exquisite that she looked at me and said, you didn't put in the bouillon. I was busted. She, she was right. But I will tell you, we then reheated it and added the bouillon and all of that. And I, I think your point about the saucier quality, she made a sauce uh, in this particular demonstration that she called a mock foie gras sauce where she had a blonde chicken liver and you have it in a blender and you throw the stock in and it's emulsified and you get this just gorgeous velvety texture from it. I have to say the food and at Peter Kump's, I got to work with a number of visiting chefs, you know, big personalities, won't name names, but they were certainly on most people's cookbook shelves. There was no one who had the palate that Madeline had. I, I think I can say that without any qualification. Her ability to taste, discern, figure out what needed to happen to get something that was just extraordinary was there, and she wasn't afraid of you know a little MSG or MSG equivalent 
if that's what you needed to round out the flavor. Anne, can we get the back? Oh, I, I guess just, you know, I think you hit it pretty much. I was at the Beard House with her one time, and one of her signature dishes was always uh, oysters and champagne sauce. And the same thing was the sauce doesn't taste right. And I remember having a little veal essence going into the Bear Blanc and probably a little bit of the bouillon. And I'm like, oh my God, we're at the Beard Foundation. You know, you could see Jim taking a shower and throwing water down. But it was yeah, same thing as you're saying. I think that that was the concept of umami before its time. More questions? Steve? Uh, this is mostly a follow-up. Was it better with the bouillon cube? Uh, it, yeah. wa it was. I, I know that it, it, Italia yeah, it, Italians use bouillon cubes and absolutely everything. Yeah, those wonderful little everything. Maggie cubes and all of that. There was something recently online someplace about how these you know, Maggie cubes get used in all different cuisines and they're all you know, slightly different versions, but it's there, it's the umami, and I can only tell you that the finished product was if not the best sauce I had ever tasted, bar none in three-star restaurants in France, it's certainly on a short list. Sure. Can I ask Ruth a, a follow-up on that book? Was there an addition done that, correct, that had the corrections in it? I actually don't know the answer, so I, don't, I doubt it. <laughs> My, I, I have no idea how well it sold and whether she had the opportunity to so okay right her yeah sure they would um this was in 1997 okay. so yes pam honing was she would know good i can ask him questions now here's the tough one all right what was her greatest strength you got to each, each, each of, yeah, go ahead. Sauces, that one was like a no-brainer. I mean, kind of like you had said, and you had said that hands down, men, women, anybody, she's in the um, pantheon of sauce makers. And I've gone through France a number of times, tried whatever. There's some people that are absolutely brilliant, but... It was, especially you were hands-on. You know, you're in a kitchen doing 300 covers, 100 covers. You know, things happen. But here you've got someone there and hitting the mark. It was, you know, I'd like to try it right now. <laughs> Comments? Yeah. Um, I, I think, she, for me, I think she was just a fabulous teacher. I mean, she expanded worlds. And um, uh, and her mind was so quick, and just she was <laughs> just so smart. And the thing that 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 we haven't talked about is that she actually, um, when she retired from cooking, she went back to school, and um, she got uh, I believe she got a master's degree in in German literature. Um, so it's like. She was a, you know, what, a Renaissance woman. Okay. Carmen? Even though she had what seemed to be a very difficult uh, public persona, and I certainly didn't know her as well as you did, my experiences were much more limited. She was extraordinarily generous. Um, I actually have my Madeleine Kamen uh, little trophy with me after working with her at Peter Kump's for 48 very, very intense hours. She actually sent me a present. The Hermes scarf. Yeah. Bob, do you have questions, comments? Pardon me? Comments on? What was her strength? Oh. Well, I, as you've figured out, was on the outside looking in. 
I never was under her wing, under her skirt. I, I just didn't have an involvement. Again, remember, she saved me. So I wasn't close. But this story came to me from the kids who worked for me. Madeline was so driven and such a perfectionist, I'm told, not an eyewitness, that she, for the restaurant in Newton, the name again? Shea Madeline. Shea Madeline. She, not a lackey, not a minimum wage person, stayed up until 2 o'clock in the morning ironing the tablecloths and napkins. This is after serving, you know, a lot of clamoring, self-aggrandizing folks who are very important, of course. And that woman, I'm told, and I don't know if this isn't strength, I don't know what is, was up until 2 o'clock in the morning ironing tablecloths. Is there any truth to that, Ruth? I, um, I, I, I wasn't in Newton, um, right. and what I remember of Glenn is uh, we, she, we did wash, or she washed the clothes, the, the linens, the aprons that we used, and, and the, the tablecloths, um, and we, I don't remember having to iron the... <laughs> the entire tablecloth, but they were put on the table and part of the setup for the restaurant because one of the things, um, she, was, she was teaching more than just cooking when you studied, at least in the, the setup for that school. Um, so you did all of the positions. Um, you rotated uh, through the different um, cooking positions in the kitchen. You also washed dishes. Um, you know, one night or one week or whatever it was, and you waited tables. Um, and so part of the setup was ironing the top of the ta the tabletop and that the 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 the, the tablecloth that that kind of showed to to the customer. Um, one of my little stories is um, uh, she she was very um, you know in some ways old fashioned too, and so. Women in her restaurants had to wear skirts or dresses. Um, that was not my style, <laughs> and uh, and 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 I, I I like to say that <laughs> that Madeline was the only person in the world that I would have put on a dress for at that point in my life or any time thereafter probably. But I did, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it. it <laughs> it didn't really work for me, but I, I did work in the dining room. Um, anyway. Regina, any question to comment on? Um, I would say that her recipes are, I mean, superb. The recipes are great. They work. Um, they're all, I mean, never been disappointed in one. I never had a problem with one. I mean, the recipes are extraordinary, but she, the great thing is she just doesn't tell you how to make something. She gives you the who, what, when, where, and why, which is really, really important with food and I think is so neglected in so many books anymore. So it's... You really get context when you make one of her recipes. What was her greatest weakness? Um, she had a bitterness when I knew her. Um, and, um, you know, I, I tell a, a story of being, of that year um, when we were in the kitchen, the, the, the class was in the kitchen one morning just getting ready for the day and doing our work and whatever. And we were all in good moods and exciting and it was really upbeat. And, uh, and Madeline walked in the kitchen um, and she had had a very different morning, obviously. And, uh, and she was a big personality. And, um, and so she walked in after obviously having a difficult um, morning and it came out <laughs> very clearly and she kind of sucked the air out of out of the room, and everything everything changed. Um, and um, <clears throat> and so little, sometimes little things would, you know, she'd have a, a a very large reaction to something small, and she had struggled. I mean, we've talked about the the Julia Childs thing, and. <sighs> You know, I mean, I, I imagine a lot of us in this room have that person that we go through life with that is, you know, that we compare ourselves to. And 
Um, I think she finally, she did find peace with it. Um, uh, and maybe leaving the food world was the way to, to find her peace for her. Um, but I think she was a little, um, she was, she was, um, she never felt like she got the, uh, the recognition that she deserved and, and, and it showed. Um, the, the thing that I took from that moment with, and my time with Madeline when, when I saw that was she was, she was a big personality. She was a leader and when, you know, as the leader, I recognized in that moment when she came into the kitchen that as the leader, you are going to determine the, your, your space. And, um, and so I kind of took that knowledge that, again, I learned, she taught me, um, and used it you know, in my life very differently. Actually highlighting, I think you brought up a really good point because luckily for me, we, I had always hit it off, but I think from what you said, there was something that drove her that was never nourished. And I always use the, the James Beard evening as she got her hat trick, she scored, and then after that, she rode off into the sunset. It was interesting because you know, we were close for years. As I said, I helped her on so many different occasions. And then it was almost like she rode off into the sunset and you didn't, you got letters from Behringer, you got whatever, but you really, the correspondence just kind of shut down like she scored and that was it, which was in some ways for me, she gave up that she got what she wanted, and you, you could tell in those right after that, because I saw something recently, it was in San Francisco, it was a, um, a, a retirement party, and from, I saw from what was it, 98 to 2000, she had a much different appearance. It looked like she had gained like five or six years, and it was really, for me, it was very, potent picture, but anyway. Bob? Um, I, again, you know, I'm really estranged to this world, and I feel deprived, because I really, as, as much as you can easily, readily struggle with Madeline and her, in your face kind of, you're nothing. <laughs> you know, that, that really happens. The one thing that I was aware of that you guys didn't bring up, um, and it was perhaps not in your time, my time being much earlier, she really championed a few of her students to the nth degree. There was a fellow named David Kantrowitz. That name mean anything? It was astounding to know that David had Madeline as an agent, as a manager, as a backer. It was powerful. We all were aware of it. David was supposed to have his own restaurant with Madeline's blessing and Madeline's guidance and Madeline's cheerleading. And not too many teachers uh, are that supportive of someone who, you know, they otherwise didn't know until the, the, the mentoring took place. So for that, I'd have to say that's another huge strength of hers. She chose certain people, and she, there was just no limit to what she would do to support them. Jimmy Schmidt was another one. I, I didn't know Jimmy very well. Danko. Danko, yeah, that was a gut name that came to yeah. mind. This David Kantowitz was a local situation in Boston, apparently very gifted, and Madeline was 24 hours a day on his crusade to get him what he wanted. Uh, I don't think it happened, but yeah, so that's, I guess Schmidt was another good yeah. example of that. She got him his job at the chop house. Yeah, well, I don't yeah. know. Okay, Regina? I just want to say one thing for cooking. My experience during that year was her breads were her weakness. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't, didn't know her personally, I can't really trash her. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy? Uh, 
Since I first met Madeline, when she was in that walking off into the sunset period, the 96 through 2000, was actually at her retirement party uh, at Behringer, there was a certain world weariness she had. You felt as if she was carrying a bit of a weight. And I remember um, when the new Making of a Cook came out, uh, there was a interview that she gave and she had one of her slightly snarky Julia swipes about she didn't want to be sugaring the berries on TV, which she, it, it was not subtle. Um, but I, I think you're right that she did want to disengage and I only saw her in that kind of exhausted phase of her life. A, a lot of, uh, Marianne, go ahead. Oh, you gotta wait, you can't. Come on. I don't know any, whether anybody can answer this, but I'm dying of curiosity. Why didn't Julia go to her restaurant? It was right there. I am under the impression that perhaps Julia had, uh, rather Madeline had made an ungracious comment, perhaps. I don't know what the chronology was and the actual origin of the spatting between the two of them. Uh, but Madeline just whispered, you know, very you know, angry and insulted that she felt she had been terribly dissed. And, you know, uh, how, why that came about, you know, if you read some of the uh, online stuff about her, apparently um, Julia had a rather vulgar but private comment about what she was going to do with Madeline, which included wearing surgical gloves and putting her in a Cuisinart. And I left out the vulgar part. Was that with Dan Aykroyd? Or? <laughs> I, I, I did a quick look through Julia Child literature to find the same uh, answer to that question, and, uh, and she makes no comment at all. So. The, the quick answer is uh, it's, it's a puzzle. But it's very clear that uh, the public uh, issue of Julie Child not being a French and not being a chef and getting all the visibility for her program, I'm sure that that contributed to some of the concern from Madeline's standpoint and then her, her complaints about Julia contributed on the other side. Steve? Uh, I, I'm just going to say this for the record, since uh, I did not know Madeline Kamen, but for I, I think maybe two or three years, for some reason, by some strange coincidence, I followed her when travel teaching. And I can tell you she was very, very tough on the people in those schools who were mostly you know, they were ladies who didn't necessarily have a lot of cooking experience, and they weren't necessarily all that concerned about the quality of their ingredients or how long their spices had been on the shelf and so on and so forth. And she really, she really burned a lot of bridges. I can tell you that people did not want to have her back again, and I heard some very funny stories about her. And I don't necessarily think this was a terrible reflection on her, but since we're just for the record, for the historical record, I will tell you this, that this is something I know about her. Okay. Roseanne. Oh, there we are. So I think we usually come to these kinds of panels and events to reinforce what we already know about someone, and especially if they're really famous, right? There's almost some kind of a I don't know, uh, adulation and adoration and veneration. And I'm so grateful to all of you because I didn't know Madeline at all um, and I don't, didn't know much about her. Her cookbook, When French Women Cook, was one of the most important cookbooks, most important books for me in my life, growing up as a young woman chef. Um, it's really one of the few books that, like, would make me weepy. Um, I knew Julia quite well. But I want to say that I'm coming away with an impression about Madeline that is so genuine 
and so beautiful um, and so real. And um, there were quite a few words that were used tonight that would not be used for Julia uh, necessarily. And, and I mean the very ones that have to do with uh, being a whole person, ups and downs, having heart, um, celebrating people, a sense of generosity. Um, so I'm really, really grateful. I think you have done her such a service, and I, this culinary luminaries um, thing that you do is really so valuable for this reason, because we're hearing from, not, we're not hearing the stories, we're not hearing what's on the internet, we're hearing real personal uh, feelings and emotions for sure. I'm not sure I've heard, seen this kind of emotion from any other chef I can think of. Um, so thank you. You were all wonderful. We have a question in the back. Hi, thank you. Um, I don't really have a question. I have sort of a, a few issues that I sort of would love to hear if, uh, if you guys could sort of mix them up in some way. Um, one is I'm interested in, with all of the conversation around women in professional restaurant kitchens these days and the Me Too movement, um, what would happen if Madeline were alive today and what would she be saying, if you could imagine? So sort of the feminist Madeline. Um, I'm also really interested in the issue about sort of how conscious we are now of identity and authenticity. And I'm, I, um, I'm Ruth's uh, spouse. And I just want to say that. So I, I've I've known um, of Madeline for 26 years, and I never had the privilege to meet her. But um, but I've had the privilege of of hearing so much about her. But this is the first time hearing hearing this piece about Julia and Madeline, and thinking, oh, Madeline was the French woman, not Julia, of course, and so. Why did we celebrate the Americanized and not go to the source? I mean, in, especially in in lieu of uh, in respect to the way that she talked about going to the source, which you had, which you had mentioned. So, just sort of some issues that have come up that I would love to know if you have any comments about. I'd, I'd like to build on the on the question. That was one of the questions I had too. All the secondary literature stresses that she was really uh, favorable towards women in the kitchen, particularly at home, home cooks, as well as in the profession. And so that wasn't raised at all. Any any comments on that? Any issues on it? Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. One thing I will have to say, you know, at least for myself, because you know, I had always heard about her aura, and I think the one thing, whether she was here today, maybe in the early 1900s it might have been different, but she really had a force field. You, if you went there, first of all, you went there because you respected who she was, because she was one of the most seminal people around. So you're not gonna like spend a year like you did if you didn't appreciate what she was doing. And also, if you did, she verbally could go all over. It was like watching an action film now. You know, good analogy, but, you know, all in all, the one thing that I was going to reflect on to deviate, she grew up during a very difficult period. You know, she grew up in recession or in depressionary France. Then the Nazis came. I remember, for me, hearing about the Nazis and having to put eggs in barrels with salt to preserve them. So there were a lot of things when you guys were talking about, you know, baggage. I'm sure any of us people who would have, you know, been there during that period, there was external baggage that didn't come out other than, you know, you're having a class and, you know, you're talking about eggs and 
we take this deviation and you know those are some of the things I guess in a roundabout way but getting back to the the premise yeah she had a force field I mean you didn't like besides why would you want to disenfranchise yourself women's roles anyone comment um, I, I can I'm sitting here thinking she really is a champion of women in fact I think it's when French women cook she speaks about herself as a feminist powerfully so it's, it's right there I was skimming it when I met Andy sitting here I was early here's another interesting point though maybe it's Ruth and only Ruth but she's championed men Gary Danko Jimmy Schmidt David Kantowitz that I happen to know about we had a fourth one who was the fourth one so that's interesting she wasn't holding back she didn't hold it against the men that they were men they were her stars they she groomed men who became famous now it may be a function more of the way our society <laughs> makes its selections but what about Ruth was she um, so she actually she was championing trying to champion me for sure um, and I'm gonna say that the reason the men are f forefront in her group of students is because it's a patriarchal society and men get the recognition and she was you know it's she wasn't teaching in in 2018 or 19 even if it is any better which I take a little issue with um, you know she was teaching in still the 1980s 1970s 1990s um, and she um, this is my I mean my personal story so we can get I can get all emotional again um, she placed me in a restaurant after I started talking to you she placed me in the restaurant that she thought was going to set me on a particular path to be in that um in uh, uh it was not positive and i don't i don't you know it, it did not turn out it, it yeah it's true but i went from this amazing year of of, of just ex expansion and 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 mind-blowing you know learning to some place that was not i mean I can say it. They, they they didn't even make veal stock at the point that I went into that kitchen, and and they were doing things that made I was the only woman in the kitchen, and they were they day after day after day they were setting me up to fail. Um, so that she she was definitely a feminist, and she was she, I think she, you know the the um I'm, I'm, I, I don't know she she was absolutely a feminist and would have um i think supported the advancement of of women as much as she possibly could yeah no um, I, I think that's absolutely true and actually joanne weir was yeah. one of yeah. her um proteges right. in that right. sense but you are right that for whatever structural reasons it's more men who are more household names yeah yeah, um, just to, to, to jump on that for, for a second, um, I was a semifinalist in the James Beard Outstanding. So my, I, I went from that experience after Madeline um, to continuing to cook um, uh, for, for several years in, in fine dining, and then I took a different path and opened uh, a, a pizza place called Pizzeria Paradiso we were the first Neapolitan style pizza place in, in Washington DC and we've been there now for almost 28 years. We have five locations. I've been very fortunate and very, you know, uh, successful, frankly. Um, but I did not do, um, did not take the path um, that Madeline kind of set out for me. And, you know, it's, it, it, um, it's the struggle that I have personally with my Madeline is that I didn't, in my mind, I didn't fulfill what I, what I, what she taught me, what she trained me, what she was kind of, I think in my mind anyway, I saw groomed. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> right. So this is this is what this is my struggles. Frankly, you know, I said I didn't I didn't realize I didn't realize how important she was in my life until until her recent her recent death. And and I have actually I, there was a memorial for her in 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 Boston that that I went to. And at that, which was in November, I wasn't ready to speak. Um, and so I think I have moved, progressed. But I started that all of that story because what I wanted to say is that, is that every time I saw a report of the semi, list of semifinalists for James Beard, of which I was one, it also mentioned the fact that the James Beard Foundation has changed their criteria, <laughs> which, you know, can can be mentioned because what what they did was they kind of opened it up and 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 wanted to uh, 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 pay attention to the quality of the person who was who was um, uh, nominated um, as well as making sure that people of color were represented making sure that women were were well represented um, so you can look at that inclusion as a as a, as a positive recognition of something that James Beard is doing, or are they say, you know, is it also there because, oh, this is the list because now it's affirmative, the affirmative action has taken hold, so. Also America changed. Are you putting cream and yeah. tomato soup on your pizza? <laughs> <laughs> no. Regina, do you have any comments at all? Oh, I just want to see the other, the other question that you had was why do we celebrate the American over the French? And it's the obvious answer is TV, I think. But it's also, and, and for the time that they both were starting out, I think it was more that you know, the, when you look at the time, life, foods of the world, those were all told, told through, the, you know, the American perspective. And so, and, and Julia Child was a great showman and a good glad hander, and a, clearly Madeline Cameron was not a glad hander. So, that's how you, you know, you look at how many no talented people are really, really successful in the food world, and makes you not even want to get out of bed because that's that goes much farther than than skill. Final question with Anne. Hi. Uh, I'm talking about what I don't really know anything about, but I just have this feeling from um, when French women cook and other things about Madeleine. Um, the, the France that produced her family uh, her friends, the people she wrote about in the book, uh, the aunt who taught her to cook, um, that France had a place for women to make very great contributions uh, in restaurant kitchens. And something about America when she got here didn't. Um, she could produce wonderful women students but there was something about the restaurant culture in this country that wasn't ready to accept women in the same way. Okay. Kind of highlighting on that, being someone who's from an outsider, and I had just come from the London Chop House, and you know there were, I guess, talking about a, I guess you could say, lack of a salacious reference playboy i think it was like back in the late 70s had the comprehensive restaurant guide you guys were in it etc and i remember every restaurant so i sent resumes out because they had the creme de la creme of people analyzing it and when you came to new york it was you had to be french you had to be in a french kitchen you had to work double shifts every day you had to toe the line, and I got to hear more times than often enough, stupid Americans, more time, whatever, and it wasn't until probably the early 90s when the egg started to crack. All of a sudden, you could see like Union Square Cafe, Montrachet, they were like these gnat competitors n eating away at the French kingdom. Even with Peter Kump one time, I had a conversation with Peter, and I was relatively close with him. And I said, you know, you're starting the Beard Foundation and all this. What about promoting Americans? He's like, I can't disenfranchise the French. 
boom, right off the bat. It wasn't even like he had, and he was a very political creature. Anybody who knew Peter, he ran a number of organizations, and he was very loquacious, didn't mince words, right off the cuff. Not going to disenfranchise the French. So I guess kind of what you said, it's a different world. I don't think anybody has to feel, even I wouldn't feel negative. I just think it's, it's a different world now, you know? As I mentioned at the beginning, this was our, this was our 13th culinary luminary panel. Uh, and I think it's one of the best. And I think these panelists have been incredible. And I wanted to thank you very much for sharing your experiences. It's been fantastic. We, uh, I hope the conversation can continue informally. I just want to say we're considering doing a program in June on Anthony Bourdain. And we would love to have comments on who should be the panelists and any suggestions that people have would be greatly appreciated. I want to uh, thank B uh, for making the connection with Ruth, uh, and that's a very helpful connection, and with Roseanne for making the connections with everybody else on the panel. So uh, it's been very appreciated, and thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. <laughs>